In a remote heart of Australia's Northern Territory lies Tennant Creek, a small town surrounded by the vast arid landscape of the North Australian Craton. Known more for its isolation and history of gold mining than for seismic activity, Tennant Creek became the unlikely epicentre of a dramatic geological event on January 22, 1988. On that day, the earth beneath this tranquil town groaned, shifted and cracked, releasing a series of powerful tremors that would go down in history as one of the most significant seismic events in Australia's history. These earthquakes not only reshaped the landscape, but also challenged our understanding of the seemingly stable continental interior. At around 10.06am, the first of three main shocks struck. Registering a magnitude of 6.3, it was followed by a second tremor of a magnitude 6.4 just a few hours later. And then the most powerful jolt, a magnitude 6.7 earthquake, hit at 9.35pm that same evening. This sequence of earthquakes sent shockwaves through the ground, reverberating far beyond Tennant Creek. Unlike the dramatic scenes often associated with such powerful earthquakes, collapsing buildings and city streets buckling, Tennant Creek was relatively lucky. Despite the force of the quakes, the town experienced limited damage. A few buildings suffered structural cracks and a natural gas pipeline that snaked through the region was bent and buckled by the force of the shifting earth. Remarkably, there were no reported injuries or fatalities. Yet the true significance of these earthquakes lay not in the immediate danger they caused, but in what they revealed about the ground beneath Tennant Creek. The Tennant Creek earthquakes brought to light a complex network of faults beneath the North Australian Craton, a stable block of the Earth's crust that had long been considered relatively quiescent. Yet the seismic events of 1988 proved that even in these ancient and stable regions, the forces of the Earth are never truly at rest. The earthquakes were primarily associated with two main faults, the Kunayonku Fault and the Lake Surprise Fault. These faults are part of a broader fault zone that runs through the Tennant Creek region, hidden beneath the surface for millennia. The 1988 earthquakes caused these faults to rupture, resulting in a dramatic surface expression of faulting that had not been seen in the region's recorded history. Surface ruptures extended up to 32 kilometers, forming fault scarps, steep cliffs created by vertical movement along the fault lines that reached heights of up to 2 meters. Geologists and seismologists flocked to Tennant Creek in the wake of these earthquakes, eager to study the rare and powerful intraplate seismic activity. Using a combination of field observations, geodetic data, and seismological analysis, they pieced together a detailed picture of the events. The discovery of reverse faulting, where one block of rock is thrust over another, was a key finding that highlighted the compressive forces at play. Thrust faulting was identified as the primary mechanism behind the Tennant Creek earthquakes. This type of faulting occurs when the Earth's crust is compressed, causing one block of rock to be pushed up over another. In Tennant Creek, this resulted in significant vertical displacement. Thrust faulting is typically associated with convergent plate boundaries, where tectonic plates collide. However, the Tennant Creek earthquakes demonstrated that such forces could also manifest in the interior of a tectonic plate far from any plate boundary. One of the most intriguing aspects of the Tennant Creek earthquakes was the evidence for conjugate faulting. Conjugate faults are a pair of faults that form in response to the same stress field but have different orientations. They essentially work together to accommodate the movement of the Earth's crust. In Tennant Creek, this phenomenon was observed in the contrasting fault dips. The Kuniyonku Scarp showed reverse faulting dipping to the south, while the western segment of the Lake Surprise Scarp exhibited dips to the north. This conjugate faulting added a layer of complexity to the seismic activity, emphasizing the intricate interplay of geological forces. The presence of conjugate faulting in Tennant Creek suggests that the Earth's crust in this region is subjected to a complex stress regime, with forces pushing and pulling in multiple directions. The immediate aftermath of the main shocks was characterized by a series of aftershocks, numbering in the thousands. These aftershocks provided valuable data on the structure and behavior of the faults involved. Seismologists deployed portable seismograph arrays to monitor the aftershocks, mapping their distribution and intensity. The pattern of aftershocks closely followed the main fault planes, confirming the geometry of the faulting and providing further evidence of the complex nature of the fault zone. The aftershocks also demonstrated the ongoing adjustment of the Earth's crust following the main seismic events, as the stresses within a fault zone slowly dissipated. The Tennant Creek earthquakes challenged the notion that the continental interiors are seismically inactive. 
They revealed that ancient fault lines, hidden beneath layers of sediment and rock, could still be active, capable of producing significant seismic events. This realisation has important implications for seismic hazard assessment, particularly in regions previously thought to be safe from major earthquakes. Understanding the potential for seismic activity in intraplate regions is crucial for ensuring the safety and resilience of communities. The insights gained from the Tenant Creek earthquakes have been applied to other intraplate settings around the world, enhancing our understanding of the geological forces that shape our planet. While the Tenant Creek earthquakes are not directly caused by the collision of tectonic plates in northern Australia, the tectonic setting of the region does play a role in the stress distribution across the continent. Australia is moving northward and is in a slow collision with the Pacific Plate. This northward movement creates a complex stress field within the Australian Plate, which can lead to intraplate earthquakes far from the plate boundaries. The stress transmitted from these northern collisions can travel across the plate, causing the reactivation of ancient faults in regions like Tennant Creek. One of the most surprising outcomes of the Tennant Creek earthquakes was the change in groundwater levels observed after the seismic events. In the months following the earthquakes, local boreholes used to supply water to Tennant Creek showed a sudden and dramatic drop in water levels, in some cases by as much as 90 centimetres. This phenomenon was attributed to the rapid draining of groundwater from uplifted fault blocks, where the sudden elevation change allowed water to flow more freely. The shift in groundwater levels provided geologists with direct evidence of how seismic activity can impact subsurface hydrology, even in arid regions. This unanticipated consequence of the earthquakes emphasised the interconnectedness of geological and hydrological systems, and proved the need to consider such effects in future seismic risk assessments and water management strategies. The Tenant Creek earthquake serves as a case study that demonstrates how earthquakes can have far-reaching effects beyond immediate structural damage, influencing natural resources that are crucial for local communities. The Tenant Creek earthquakes of 1988 proved that even in the most ancient and seemingly stable regions, the forces of tectonics are at work, constantly reshaping the landscape. The hidden faults beneath Tenon Creek, silent for millions of years, awoke with a fury that shook the outback and provided a glimpse into the restless nature of the region. The lessons from Tenon Creek are clear. The earth beneath our feet is more dynamic than we may realise, and we must remain vigilant, always ready to learn from the tremors that occasionally remind us of the powerful forces at work beneath the surface. I hope you found this as interesting as I do, and as always, thanks for watching. On October 14, 1968, the tranquil town of Meckering in Western Australia was suddenly thrust into chaos. At approximately 10.58am, the ground beneath this small agricultural community shook with a force that registered a magnitude of 6.8 on the surface wave magnitude scale, marking one of the most significant intraplate earthquakes in Australia's history. This earthquake not only altered the physical landscape, but also left a profound impact on the lives of those who experienced its devastating power. Meckering is located within the Yilgarn Craton, an ancient geological formation that spans much of Western Australia. This craton is one of the oldest parts of the Earth's crust, and primarily comprises of Archean-era high-grade metamorphic rocks, including granitoids and various other rock types, intersected by Proterozoic dikes. Despite the region's perceived geological stability, the Yilgarn Craton lies within the Southwest Seismic Zone, an area known for unexpected seismic activity. The local terrain around Meckering is mostly flat, with few outcrops visible due to the extensive weathering of the underlying rocks. The area is characterised by deeply weathered granitoids and metasedimentary rocks, with a complex network of faults crisscrossing the subsurface. These faults, which run in multiple orientations, play a critical role in the region's seismic dynamics, predisposing the area to both dextral and reverse faulting when seismic stresses are released. At the time of the earthquake, Meckering was a modest farming town, home to about 240 residents. The day began uneventfully, with people going about their usual routines. Unbeknownst to them, the stress along the faults beneath their feet was reaching a critical level. Suddenly, the ground began to heave and crack as a series of faults ruptured in quick succession, creating a violent shaking that lasted for nearly a minute. The primary rupture zone extended about 37 kilometres, including several faults, the Meckering Fault, the Splinter Fault, and the Burgess Fault Complex. These faults, hidden beneath the surface, were exposed as the earth opened up, forming an intricate pattern of fractures and displacements. 
The Meckering Fault featured a notable dip between 35 and 52 degrees, indicative of both compressional and lateral movement. The faulting involved both dextral slip and reverse thrusting, leading to vertical displacements of up to 2.45 meters and horizontal offsets up to 1.54 meters. The magnitude of the Meckering earthquake has been recorded differently in various sources. While many records state that the earthquake had a magnitude of 6.8 on the surface wave magnitude scale, some sources report it as a 6.6 .6 on the moment magnitude scale. This discrepancy arises from the use of different measurement scales, which can yield slightly different magnitudes due to their varying sensitivities and calculations. Both scales, however, agree on the significant impact of the earthquake, which was felt over a vast area and caused widespread damage. The earthquake's impact on the town of Meckering was catastrophic. Many of the town's buildings, constructed without consideration for seismic events, were severely damaged or completely destroyed. Houses crumbled, the local water pipeline ruptured, and the railway line was left twisted and bent, cutting off a vital transport route. Roads were broken apart and fence lines, once straight, were now offset by several metres. The natural environment was also dramatically altered. Trees were uprooted and large cracks appeared in the ground. Streams saw their flow patterns disrupted. This impact on the river system was one of the many ways the earthquake reshaped the landscape around Meckering. One of the most significant environmental impacts of the Meckering earthquake was the rerouting of a stream in the region. The seismic activity caused a notable shift in the stream's course. In the weeks following the earthquake, aerial photographs revealed that the stream's pre-1968 path had been disrupted by the surface faulting prompting local authorities to undertake earthworks to re-establish the stream's original flow path. This rerouting is a vivid example of how seismic events can alter not just the human-made environment, but also the natural hydrology of an area, with it impacting ecosystems and land use. In the aftermath of the main quake, Meckering and its surrounding areas experienced numerous aftershocks, with the largest reaching a magnitude of 5.7. These aftershocks further damaged buildings and infrastructure, compounding the fear and uncertainty among the residents. Many people chose to sleep outside, fearing that further quakes might collapse their already weakened homes. The aftershocks also provided more data on the fault system beneath Meckering. The fault showed complex interactions of thrusting and lateral movements, demonstrating the intricate nature of the subsurface geology. The presence of these aftershocks and the potential for future seismic events emphasized the need for better understanding and preparation in such seismically active regions. The 1968 Meckering earthquake offered invaluable insights into intraplate seismicity, an area of study less understood than the more common interplate earthquakes, which occur along tectonic plate boundaries. High resolution aeromagnetic surveys conducted in the area revealed how ancient geological structures influenced the faulting patterns. These surveys identified that the fault ruptures closely correlated with linear magnetic anomalies, which were interpreted as faults and dikes within the bedrock. These features suggested that the earthquake was a result of the reactivation of ancient geological structures under the current stress regime. The analysis showed that the main rupture likely initiated at a depth of around 3 kilometers, with a dominant movement along the north-south trending east dipping thrust fault. This faulting was consistent with the regional stress field, which had an east to west orientation of maximum principal stress. The intersection of various geological structures created zones of stress concentration, leading to the earthquake's occurrence. The Meckering earthquake left a lasting mark on the town and its inhabitants. In the immediate aftermath, rebuilding efforts focused on constructing buildings that could withstand future seismic events. The earthquake also prompted changes in building codes and construction practices across Western Australia, emphasizing the need for earthquake-resistant designs. For the scientific community, the Meckering earthquake served as a critical case study for understanding intraplate seismicity, it underscored the importance of studying ancient fault systems and the potential for significant seismic events in areas previously thought to be stable. The earthquake demonstrated that even in regions with no history of recent seismic activity, the right combination of geological and stress conditions could lead to significant earthquakes. The 1968 earthquake proves that even in seemingly stable regions, the Earth is dynamic and ever-changing, shaped by forces that have been at work for billions of years. The lessons learned from Meckering continue to inform our understanding of earthquakes and the need to prepare for the unexpected in our ever-changing world. I hope you found this topic to be as interesting as I did, and as always, thanks for watching.
Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.